I cannot believe that we're already in the back half of 2024. Are you kidding me? But here we are. Before you know it, the calendar will be turning again. And that means we are already getting ready for 2025 conferences. And one that I'm personally very excited to attend again is the Insights EDU conference. If you care at all about growing enrollment and building a student-centered higher ed experience, you really should be at this conference. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. That's visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. Attention. Registration is now open for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2024 Annual Conference, Protecting the Future Champions for Higher Education, December 11th through 13th, 2024 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Don't miss out. Register today at msche.org slash annual dash conference. We'll see you there. Hey, everybody. This is Elvin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience, and today we are extremely excited to announce our paid subscription service. By subscribing today, you will get exclusive early access to ad-free episodes, extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events, all while helping to sustain EdUp. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com and subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast where we make education your business. Um, you all know for, for my listeners here, we are so close, you guys, so close to passing 400,000 downloads of the Edup Experience podcast across our 950 or so episodes. We appreciate you all so much for listening. Um, we, we I just heard from um, from a longtime listener uh, that we were exchanging uh, messages over email and he says he listens to me uh, on his way to work every day. And I said, man, if you're going to listen to me every day, uh, I, I don't know, my voice gets annoying even to myself. That's how often I talk here at the Ed Up Experience podcast. Ask my wife and she'll tell you that no one could possibly listen to me every day. Um, that's, that's what she would say. Um, but then I talk. Uh, I would talk to her every day. Anyway, you get the point. Um, we continue to push out incredible content. We, we can't stop. There's so many great people to still interview uh, across the world. 300 presidents will be passed by the time 300 interviews with presidents will be will pass by the time this episode airs in the next three weeks or so. So it'll be about three weeks from from this uh, from this recording. 300 college and university presidents. Can you imagine the amount of insights that we have been able to collect that are available to you to listen to? And we've got another amazing president here for you today because there's just so much great work happening right now. What, where are we? What does right now mean? Right now is the middle of August, which means the boots have hit the ground. The students are back, baby, and boy, sweat is dropping from the brows of higher ed administrators all across the land. Um, one person who is literally sweating because he just ran across campus on his iPhone, I got a, a impromptu campus tour as we prepared for this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, he is Dr. Frank Sanchez. He is the president at Manhattanville University. Frank, welcome to an Ed Up Mike. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks so much. Yeah, I was moving in uh, some of our new students just uh, a moment ago as you caught me uh, coming across campus. But, uh, you know, as, as many colleges are experienced right now, the energy, the excitement, uh, the the just the the newness of the time of the year is very exciting for Manhattanville, and we're ready to get this uh, this fall semester started. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, and I I, I want to start because that um, that this moment is always a moment when when students hit the campus again, you know, the, everything gets dusted off, everything's been prepared, and now it's time for everybody to move in. And you're in, um, you're, you've got your short sleeve shirt on, your baseball cap, and you literally were out amongst the students. And so visibility is a really important part 
in my mind, of being a, a campus president. There are some that are less visible, to be quite honest with you. I've interviewed so many leaders. There are some that are more visible, less visible. There's really a spectrum. What's your take on visibility and its importance to, to the students and families? Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, I think it depends on uh, the e the institutional ethos and culture, certainly within the administration, the mission of the institution, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's institutional saga. At Manhattanville, uh, we really pride ourselves on a personalized, student-centered, student-ready learning experience. And part of those values uh, and part of those um, kind of core values of the institution has to come out from the leader uh, and the president of the institution. So I think it's incredibly important that I'm visible uh, this year in particular, as many institutions are struggling with enrollments, uh, we're very excited that we're bucking the national trends. We're going to see our, our experience here right now, 9% enrollment growth of new Amazing. students. Amazing. And so all the more reason why it's important that certainly I get out there, our administration gets out there, and the entire community to welcome these students, welcome these parents uh, to the Manhattanville or the Valiant experience uh, here in Purchase, New York. Amazing. 9% enrollment growth is no small feat, by the way. I don't care what kind of, I don't care if you start at 10 and you go to, to, to whatever. I mean, 9% is a lot, especially when you're dealing in hundreds, particularly in a time as higher ed's value is questioned. We, we are seeing the homogenization of higher education. Everybody's kind of doing things the same. You talked about marketing and branding, and I do want to talk about that in a minute. Absolutely. But the sub asterisk asterisk yes to um that nine percent enrollment growth was 20 percent growth in transfer students which i think is right. a massively important statistic well joe even better than that since 2021 we've seen a 52 percent increase in new students at Manhattan. Wow. uh and you know and i think there's a number of factors that go into why it is changing for us uh, we recently uh, uh, launched our new university status. And while I think that helped us a little bit on the perimeter, I think, was, to your point a little bit earlier, and there's a lot of statistics out there about the value of higher ed and the public discourse regarding higher ed. But I saw a study that said 51% of Americans are questioning the value of a college education. Yikes. Which means we have to do, higher education uh, administrators and leaders, have to do a better job showing the return on investment, showing the social mobility and what families, what students are getting in return for their dollars. And, and I'm happy to say, you know, we, we, I think, have a very good start. U.S. News and World Report last year ranked us number one among all nonprofit private institutions in the state of New York in social mobility. I think more families are beginning to see us as a first choice because of the return on investment and the value. You know, we've designed a, a learning experience here where students see, see the value immediately. Uh, you know, a lot of institutions uh, will talk about it and they do provide internships or study away or si significant, you know, practicum service learning projects. But when you arrive on campus, you have to go find it. You have to seek it out. And, you know, in many ways, it's it's by chance students will come across those experiences. In many ways, they're episodic. And Manhattanville, by design, 100% of our students will walk away with a hands-on significant experiential learning opportunity. What, and, what, percent, what percentage of students did you say? 100%. 100%. I just wanted to make sure I had the button ready for you. Yeah, um, no, it, it's important. That's amazing. It, no, it's by design and it's built into our curriculum. It's built in to the Valiant experience here. And I think that adds value. That helps us make our case to our families about the importance of a, 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 a you know, high quality, high value collegiate experience in today's arena. And we have to continue to differentiate ourselves uh, amongst our peers today. I would say if you're wanting to be more homogenous, in the collegiate experience, I don't think that's a recipe uh, for for great success. We uh, it's the name of the game is differentiate yourself. Yes, uh, be distinctive, and and I think we we're doing a number of things that are are doing that amongst our peers.
You talked about uh, rebranding, marketing. It's one of the first initiatives that you had coming in. It's like, how do we position this university? And, you know, I've said on this podcast many times that I believe that we, higher ed administrators in many respects, have helped to create this value perception, this, this lack of value, because we didn't actively communicate the actual value. We just sort of waited for students to go, oh, I think this is a value. Oh, I think that's a value. If you look at an institution, you say, what is it that we do that's different? And we have to actively communicate this rapidly, robustly, all the time, frequently within a brand to say, this is who we are, this is what we do, and this is how we're different. Much like other products and services out there, whether you think higher ed, the consumer, whether you think a student's a consumer or a customer or not, you still actually have to say what it is that you do and, and what's different. And I think that there, were, there are institutions out there that are helping to fi- solve this problem now, like Manhattanville, where you're saying, this is why we're different, and we're going to communicate it, we're going to market we're going to market to this student. You, don't you think, what, what do you think about that whole thing? Do you think we've helped create this by sitting back? And, and I say we, not me and you in particular, of course, not us, but others that maybe waited for higher ed to kind of just write the ship on its own without taking the bull by the horns. Yeah. You know, I, I think for many years, our industry uh, was fortunate, lucky to have uh, enrollments uh, coming yeah. in, you know, so many state, public institutions, my entire career has been in public higher ed. You know, I've come across many institutions that they're really not, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, really weren't doing robust enrollment management. We're really responding to applications and responding to inquiries. And that made them respond to students who knew. Yeah, yeah. They, They just, you know, the inquiry cards and they processed enrollments. And that quickly has changed. Now you actually have to recruit. And the sophistication, as you know, the sophistication of business intelligence systems of customer data, customer profile data uh, has really changed how we think about enrollment. The the shotgun approach uh, has long left us years and years ago. And the sophistication of data and the use of data and actual intelligence has really become key in the work that we do. All the more reason why institutions have to continuously deliver their message, their narrative of what makes them different from any of the peers they're competing with. You know, and there's always, there's so much noise around students now too. The way students receive information is evolving on a daily basis. So the question is, do you want to be in front of the student or do you want the Instagram ad that tells the student not to go to college to be in front of the student? Like we, we have to be in the game, right? We have to be in front of the student. Well, I, I actually say it's all of the above. You know, we're actually gathering data now that shows that many of our students that are visiting campus They're visiting it because of our Instagram. They're seeing photos, they're seeing energy, they're seeing excitement, and they're saying, I I want to learn more about that. Yeah. It's not necessarily our website that hits them first, it's our Instagram, and then they learn more about the institution. Yes. Uh, And you want to be in front of them as well. You want to uh, convey the energy, the excitement on a personal level uh, to hopefully resonate with them and their family and their parents. Uh, as to why Manhattanville should be uh, among their top choices when selecting a higher ed institution. So you are have a student affairs, student success background in your career. And it's, I'm not going to say it's, it's atypical because I think it's happening more, but the the more typical path to a college presidency has been through academics, dean, you know, fa- faculty, dean, provost, blah, 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 program director, provost, so on. And I, I have written actually in, in my book and many articles, and I have said the student leaders, student affairs, even enrollment, and so are, are in my mind where the presidents will come from in the future. Because the customer is so sensitive these days, you need somebody that really understands a lot of those nuances. Can you talk about your background a little bit and how it's prepared you to be a president in multiple institutions and, and why you believe you're so successful? Calling all higher ed marketing and enrollment management professionals. Here, here. The Insights EDU conference is back. This is your chance to level up your marketing and enrollment management strategies, and the Edup Experience podcast will be there once again. Join us at the Ritz-Carlton, New Orleans, February 12th through 14th, 
For an unforgettable conference, registration is now open with early bird pricing. Outstanding. Attention. Registration is now open for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2024 Annual Conference Protecting the Future, Champions for Higher Education, December 11th through 13th, 2024 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Don't miss out. Register today at msche.org slash annual dash conference or head to msche.org and click on the conference link. I'll see you there. Hey, everybody. This is Ovin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience. Are you enjoying the conversation so far? Good. I hope so. Did you know that you could actually hear this conversation early before anybody else and ad free so you don't have to hear my voice during these ads? And did you also know that you could get extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content? That's right. Original content and invites to special events all while helping to sustain EdUp? Well, if you didn't know, now you know. So go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com and become a subscriber today. First, you got to sign up to our free email newsletter, and then you'll find out how to become a subscriber. Again, go to edupexperience.com. No, absolutely. You know, it started certainly during my undergraduate years. I I was a former student athlete uh, at the University of Nebraska. When I stopped being an athlete, I had to pay for my college because I was on scholarship. And so I became an RA and that paid for room and board. I got involved in student clubs and organizations And through that process, I started learning about administration, what I thought they should be doing better. And through protesting administration, saying that, you know, your policies, your programs, your resources, your services should better support students. I literally asked myself, well, how do these guys get these jobs? And that's when I learned about master's and Ph.D. programs in higher ed. And so that off I went uh, to Colorado State for their student affairs higher ed program. Uh, the Doctorate of Higher Administration from Indiana University. Uh, And and then early on in my career, I went into multicultural affairs. At first, I thought I wanted to be a director of multicultural affairs. I was assistant director at DePaul University and and learned more about the programmatic and administrative pieces, but always wanted to have a greater impact. Always still wanted to change the policies and programs and the direction and the decisions impacting the institution. Uh, from there, I went to uh, the University of Wyoming and, and was uh, associate director and an interim director of the housing system. And there, you know, and I think a lot of uh, individuals who come up through the ranks of student affairs oftentimes come up through the housing experience for a number of reasons. One, they're dealing with large budgets. They're dealing with uh, 24-7 student communities. They're dealing with facilities and capital construction. Uh, They're managing a a little town in many ways. And I think those provide tremendous transferable skills for upper level administration opportunities. Uh, From there, and and the University of Wyoming at the time had about 2,600 students in the residence halls there. Uh, I, from there, I became the vice president for student affairs at a campus of 2,200 students in Alamosa, Colorado, at the time, Adams State College, oh, I know uh, an HSI in Alamosa. And that's really where I cut my teeth as an executive administrator. Uh, you know, I was a vice president at 31, but I was a b- vice president for six years. We transformed uh, uh, student retention and graduation rates and enrollment rates. Uh, we grew uh, undergraduate enrollment in one year by 26%. Uh, we were recognized by uh, ASCU as one of the top performing Hispanic serving institutions in the nation by growing four year graduation rates of Latino students from 15%, 15% to 51% wow. in three years. Uh, dramatic changes through curricular based learning communities. Uh, through a Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, a Title V grant, and really the mobilization of the entire executive team, uh, 360 advising. I could go on and on of what we did to transform the success rate. And it was that experience that really gave me the bug to want to do more. And from there, I went to the University of Colorado Denver, the downtown Denver campus as the 
Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Chief Student Affairs Officer, uh, both for the downtown Denver campus and the Anschutz Medical Center, uh, where I was involved with building up a division of student affairs, a new uh, health and wellness program, a new dean of students, a new veteran affairs center, and consolidated student services across the medical center there, uh, the Anschutz Medical Center. After five years as associate vice chancellor, I, I was approached by uh, the City University of New York uh, to help build a system of very strong divisions of student affairs. Uh, and so I became the vice chancellor of the City University of New York, which as you may know, is uh, the largest urban public university in America, yeah. serving a half a million students a year with 25 campuses, seven community college, colleges, 11 four-year institutions, and eight uh, graduate and professional schools. And I got to tell you, that was one of the most rewarding experiences I had because it gave me a chance to build public and private, public governmental partnerships to leverage the resources of New York City to serve a half a million students annually. I mean, and the so, scale is unbelievable. Oh, the scale. And, 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 and that's what we're all trying to do in higher education today is how do we scale up yeah. impact and, and value and quality of, and enrollments for our students. And I had that uh, at the City University of New York. And, and you know, that it just, that way if we have another podcast, I can share with you some of the programming that we did literally across the city, uh, such as addressing food insecurities. We tripled the number of meals and pounds of food through a partnership with the Food Bank of New York City and the City University of New York as one example. Uh, foster care uh, initiatives and other work as well. From there, you know, I, I had a kind of a, a front seat to watch and observe and learn from 24 presidents. Um, and what an opportunity that was. You know, if, if there was ever an internship or a practicum in higher ed for folks who are thinking about the possibilities of being a college president, there isn't one better than that exposure. Uh, that I got to watch and see both good and bad decisions, how new presidents came and how they dealt with crisis and challenges and and the skill sets just across the, the system. Uh, and so after six years of the vice chancellor, uh, I was then selected to be the president of uh, Rhode Island College, uh, which I was a president for six years and uh, just really fortunate to enter the institution at that time found great success on a number of fronts from a new branding campaign uh, to bringing in uh, tens of millions of dollars in approved voter approved referendum, uh, $25 million for uh, modernize our school of education, $38 million to approve, uh, to enhance our science laboratory school, uh, another $50 million plus for a new uh, uh, nursing education center in downtown Providence and in partnership with the University of Rhode Island and, and Brown University. We doubled annual giving 200%, secured our largest and third largest gifts in the history of the institution. So just great success and really fortunate to have Fantastic. an amazing team, the people that transformed that institution. Uh, to then, uh, I've been now, just finished my first year at Manhattan, uh, Manhattanville and uh, continuing to see some tremendous success uh, here, which we certainly can talk about in, in detail. I like your style, dude. You've said so much in there. By the way, we're what, most people are in higher ed, at least two degrees separated. We're only one degree separated. I think you're on the board of um, HACU, uh, the Hispanic uh, Association for Colleges and Universities, and I had Antonio Flores on this podcast. Uh, there you go. A while, a little bit while back. He was great, by the way. Well, in fact, uh, Antonio Flores was on our campus this last October as we became a member of HACU uh, here in, in, in Purchase. Um, also, an, an important board opportunity. I mean, you know, as we see the population of students change in this country, the new majority, as it were, students of color. We have um, we have more students that are coming from um, lower economic backgrounds that have an opportunity to access college and change generational wealth for their families. And we have a load of institutions looking at social mobility is really the new college ranking. You know, how do we help people? 
get into college and succeed and get out and make earn earn a living, make money that's going to help their their kids and those kids and those kids. Uh, and there's never been a more important time for higher ed- education yet. Back to our value conversation. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. Kids question it. Still, kids, adults still question it. What are you seeing in this incoming class in terms of of um, excitement, trepidation, mental health concerns, all of the above? How, what's the what's the energy like? Sure. You know, I, I see a, on our campus a pretty high level of energy. You know, we're we're now getting a year, almost two years out of COVID, and I think these many of these students, you know, were in middle school. In high school, not long ago, when that was going on, and are really wanting to get a fresh start. Um, and, and, but they, there's some anxiety because you know whether it's social skills or or stress or different uh, anxieties in general, they they recognize that uh, college is going to be you know a, a bit of a challenge on that front. Uh, but they they want to jump into it, and and they're ready to get out and begin to develop those friends, develop those community, be a part of those communities, and build those networks. You think there's a more uh, physical presence that's desired? Like I want to be among my friends. I want to be in on boots on the ground in this campus. It, it, but balanced. I, I think yeah. more and more students uh, appreciate their their alone time, the quiet time, uh, time to kind of rest and recover from all of the uh, uh, you know interaction. It really depends. It's a real mix of students that we're seeing. Without question, both students and families they're looking for affordability. They're looking yeah. for value. And I think colleges have to do a better job and, and come up with a better financing model of how we support both public but our private institutions as well. You know, when I was at Rhode Island, we worked with the state uh, to provide significantly reduced public transportation uh, with the state public transportation system. Uh, over the course of three, four years, we saved our students a million dollars in, um, in uh, online textbooks. Uh, open open educational resources. I think we have to do a better job uh, providing real value to our students. Right now at Manhattanville, you know, many institutions, uh, they do four plus one programs, right? Yeah. We get a bachelor's and master's degree in five years. Uh, Joe, in the next 12 months, we're going to be announcing that 100% of our majors are going to provide four plus one pathways. Every single Every single program for our students, if they choose, they can get an advanced degree in five years. Uh, we believe one way to differentiate ourselves, but more importantly, to drive social mobility is saving students an entire year towards a graduate degree and helping them finish it up uh, both the bachelor's and master's degree in five years. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by that and also mad at myself that I didn't think of that. Um, but when you look at what's possible for us, you know, we're, we, we higher ed, we're, con- we have certain constraints on us. We have the Carnegie unit, we have certain schedules, we can have alternative schedules, but, but by and large, we have calendars and we have to abide by certain regulations and such, but something like that is absolutely possible. Having an advanced degree opportunity for every single major, that's, that's really a pathway. And even if it did exist before it existed, it might've existed as an assumption. Like, yeah, you could do this and then you could do that. But to organize that and say, here, 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 here's how you do it. Now that's capturing value and communicating it. Absolutely. We're also uh, plan to launch in 12 months, a three-year honors degree program for very the same reasons you just brought up. So many of our honor students, are already taking 18, 19, 20, 21 credits. We're just going to tweak the summer months a little bit. Yeah. And you have a three-year, you have a three-year honors degree program. I think there's a lot of ways in which higher ed can rethink the delivery of their degrees. We, you know, we're a state leader right now in social mobility, but if we want to be a regional and national leader on this front, we got to continue to innovate and think about how we deliver our education and our mission differently. Yeah. So you know, this is uh, the, the what makes this conversation great is because of the momentum that you create. And I, I believe that momentum is 
really key to higher ed. When you, when you are doing well, everybody's mindset is turned the right way, right? And yeah. it just grows and grows and grows. And it's really hard if you're in decline to turn that mindset around because people become used to it. So, you know, as a leader, how do you create and sustain momentum? No, so it, it, I'm, it's, it's, I'm laughing because of the words you used. Just yesterday, we had our faculty staff kickoff. Uh, to, you know, before the students get here, just to reunite, you know, introduce all of our new faculty and staff. But what I shared with our community is that if there's one way to describe this past year, it was a year of momentum building. And so many things happened because of our community, because of our innovative faculty, because of our caring staff, uh, because of our energized students. We advanced the institution on so many fronts. And, and I, I, you oftentimes need to have some quick wins, but you need to empower people to get energized and excited to make changes. One example, there's several, but one example, when I arrived, there, there wasn't much infrastructure for grant development. Mm -hmm. I think on an annual basis, we probably brought in 100,000, maybe 150,000. Uh, today, I'm happy to report we brought in $1.3 million, but we have an, an additional $10 million pending at the federal level. Surprise! And Love so we, we have said we have got to begin to build our uh, sponsor programs apparatus. We got focused. We got serious about it with some uh, minimal funding, and we're well on our way to now be very competitive for a variety of state and federal grants. Uh, advancements, you know, we, uh, I heard from alumni across the country that they wanted more outreach and more connections. Uh, we grew alumni engagement 37% this past year uh, by outreach, by Zoom, uh, by personalizing uh, connections with alumni across the country. Uh, very exciting on that front. Athletics just took off. You know, we saw the most, con and I had not, most of these things I have nothing to do with because it's amazing staff and faculty and administrators and coaches. But this last year, our students, I, I met with them at the beginning of the year at Ice Cream Social. And I said, I'll tell you what, if any of you get a, a conference championship, dinner on me. We had the most conference championships in two decades. <laughs> So yeah, now you'll be working until you're 95, Frank, because you've spent so much money. <laughs> our, our, our women's volleyball, our men's soccer, our women's tennis, our women's tennis were zero and 10 last year. They won the conference championship. That's incredible. And our, and our, and our women's softball. Uh, but anyway, I think building the momentum, you hit it right, the, the nail on the head getting some quick wins, empowering, and then celebrating those successes, celebrating in writing. I, you know, we started up monthly videos where I give updates across campus, but then personally doing at these kickoff events, bringing our community together. And it, it really has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the energy, the ethos, the excitement, the skills, talents, and expertise of our campus community and the work they're doing. You know, um, I, I'll push back on that a little bit because I think it does have something to do with you. And I'll tell you why I think that I've interviewed a lot of leaders, a lot, probably more than anybody in, in I don't know if I could say the world, but in 950, almost a thousand formal interviews with leaders across the world in the last five years, there are leaders and then there are inspirational leaders. And I believe in higher ed, you have to all as a college president, your a game, there's never a B game. Your A game is on all the time because everybody's going to look to you and say, we've hit this barrier. We've hit this obstacle. I need some kind of inspiration to be able to, to push and, because dealing with students is hard. Working with students every day is hard. Students have more mental health concerns that wears on our individual health concerns as we have interactions with students. You can't help but have that some of that runoff. You're going to have complaints and some negativity around you, but there's always this positive message that we're changing lives, that we're pushing forward, and always as the president, and your A game is it's like check up from the neck up every day, right? You got to own it. So there's there's this providing this inspiration, this continual inspiration that everybody comes to depend on. How do you keep inspired and how do you keep providing that vision and that inspiration on a daily basis? And how often do you need to do it? Oh, I, it's it's all the time. It's it's celebrating the successes, whether it's our 
our School of Nursing, our School of Education, our Arts and Sciences, if it's our enrollment management team, our advancement team, it's public recognition and it's private recognition. Yeah, uh, I, That's so important. And I do one-on-ones with my team. So there's tremendous opportunity to do the praise and recognition. Uh, but it's also saying, hey, uh, we, we take this work seriously. Uh, I perfect, I expect high levels of professionals. And so there's a healthy do- dose of accountability as well. Uh, but yeah, and it's, it's ongoing. That's our work. Today's world, you know, the, st- it, it, the status quo it, it is no longer acceptable um, because you are falling behind if you're keeping the same. Uh, and so you constantly got to be evolving, developing, enhancing, improving uh, and that starts with data. It starts with good thinking. I view my cabinet as a brain trust. Uh, they are the thought leaders of the institution. And yes, I needed them to be experts within their individual divisions, but I need their mind uh, to help solution find and think about the future of the institution in a tactical and strategic way and be leaders of their areas and of the institution. Uh, and so that's that's everyday work uh, doing that. That's a fact. That's a fact. Uh, I'm going to try to get you to come back for an individual episode for our subscribers. Hopefully I've convinced you. Uh, But I want to give you an open mic, uh, Frank. What else do you want to say about Manhattanville uh, that you haven't talked about yet? That I haven't talked about? Uh, You know, I I think our trustees kind of framed this tagline as Mville's on the move. Mm. Uh, And I got to tell you, we we really are uh, from... Uh, our enrollments uh, really beginning to take off and really bucking the national trends uh, to some of the innovation we're doing uh, on the curriculum front uh, to rethinking in, in our practices and the use of business intelligence and uh, generating new revenue streams for the institution. Uh, you know, I'm very excited to, to think about the future of Manhattanville. And I think um, in the not too distant future, I'm hopeful that both at a regional and national level, uh, individuals will begin to see how we're reimagining the liberal arts education uh, for the 21st century. So uh, thank you so much for giving me some time, Joe, and I, I look forward to joining you, uh, you again. Well, there you had everybody. He is the one. He is the only. Dr. Frank Sanchez. He's the president at Manhattanville University, and he is kicking some serious tires we'll say in moving the institution forward ladies and gentlemen you've just ed upped higher education is evolving and if you're in marketing and enrollment management then you need to be at the insights edu conference that's a fact that's a fact insights edu 2025 is happening february 12 through 14 in new orleans louisiana This is your chance to explore the latest trends in higher education and discover new and innovative strategies to level up your program marketing and enrollment. Hear from some of the best speakers in the industry, from companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and more. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Attention. Registration is now open for the Middle States Commission on Higher Education 2024 Annual Conference Protecting the Future Champions for Higher Education. December 11th through 13, 2024 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Don't miss out. Register today at msche.org slash annual dash conference. We'll see you there. Hey, everybody. This is Elvin Freitas, co-founder of the Edup Experience. Did you enjoy that conversation? I hope you did. Did you know that you can actually hear this conversation early on? and ad-free. And you can also hear extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events all while helping to sustain EdUp. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't know, now you know. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com to subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, that's edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com.